Hello, welcome again to Bench Warmers. It was great to see some live golf on TV over the weekend and got out and saw some actual in-person baseball over the weekend. So here's hoping that our health situation holds up. Coming up on the show this week, the Kairos Volleyball Club has become one of the premier youth programs in the region. We will check in with club director Mitch Lunning and find out why that is. And the man with the microphone at South Dakota State, radio guy Tyler Merriam, talking a return timetable for Jackrabbit football, and he and I team up to pick our SDSU Mount Rushmore, the top four Jackrabbit athletes of the last decade. But we start with baseball, and while Major League millionaire players and billionaire owners fight over money, it's guys like Jake Adams that are caught in the crossfire. Adams is from Brandon, South Dakota. He played at a junior college and then had one fantastic season at the University of Iowa that launched him into the Houston Astros organization, and he was making a rapid, steady climb through their minor league system. But right now, of course, that is all on hold. But there may be a chance that Adams still could get some swings in at the major league level this summer. All right, Jake Adams, how are you in this uh, wacky world we're living in right now, man? <laughs> uh, been hanging in there. Obviously, it's a tough time, and uh, um, a lot of craziness has been going on, but uh, been getting through it, been still working out, still kind of like I'm still treating this as my season, so I'm still working out um, four days a week. Um, obviously, coming out here and practicing with these guys and getting getting some baseball stuff in, it's um, it's been helping me out, but yeah, it's been, it's been very crazy. You should be playing baseball in Texas somewhere right now, right? Where, where would you be in normal times? Yeah, so I, right now I'd, I'd be in Corpus Christi, Texas, uh, probably getting ready for a game about this time, um, and probably a little bit warmer weather than we have here, but um, yeah, I'd be, be down in Corpus and getting ready to play. I remember you as a pretty good hoops player as well, man. Just an athlete, was baseball your favorite sport or did you just play everything? Um, I mean, baseball was always my first love. Um, yeah, I was, I was okay at the other sports, but I knew baseball was going to take me the furthest in my career and um, get me a semi-college degree. Kind of got cut short my, after my junior year, getting drafted and whatnot. But, um, I mean, I loved baseball, and obviously I love football too, but took my senior year off just because I knew um, I was going to go play baseball. I didn't, didn't want any knee injuries or anything, but um, played all four years of basketball, and, I mean, I, I loved, loved the sport. And then went to Des Moines. What clicked at Iowa? 29 home runs. And as you said, your junior year, your one year at Iowa. But you talk about historically, Chris Bryant hit 31 uh, in one season at San Diego. Mark McGuire hit 32 home runs. That's the company you were in with that year that you had at Iowa, hitting 29 home runs. What clicked that year? Um, I think just believing in myself. And uh, my the fall of my first year at Iowa, we had a, a hitting coach named Pete Lorsted. And uh, he's actually, that was his first year there. But when I was playing at DMAC, he was actually one of our rivals in JUCO at Nyack. Um, so he, he saw me the two years that I was at DMAC. He saw the type of hitter I was. He comes to Iowa my first year there, too. And um, he just made a couple little tweaks to my swing. And I mean, it, it was a game changer. It, I, I took off from there. And um, unfortunately, he ended up um, getting a job with uh, Cleveland Indians. So he left before the season could even start. So we had a new hitting coach come in. And I'm like, I could now I have to start over. Luckily, um, it was our hitting coach that we had at DMAC, the one that got me to Iowa. He comes in. I mean, he, he knew the hitter. Obviously, I was from coaching me and um, knowing Pete and everything. He didn't change anything with me, just kept tweaking. I mean, just small little things and um, had the season I had. Obviously, I never thought I would hit 29 home runs at the D1 level. I knew I was a power guy, but hitting 29 home runs was something that, I mean, I still dream of doing. Like, it, it doesn't even, it haven't even sank in yet to me. Astros pick sixth round in 2017. Is that about where you thought you should have been? Were you happy with that position? Um, I knew I was going to get drafted. Uh, I talked to um, my junior year at Iowa. I talked to every MLB team except for two, and it was the Red Sox and the Yankees, which <laughs> I'm, I'm okay. That I didn't go to any of those guys because they have a lot of prospects, and it's hard to yeah. make your way up in those organizations. But um, after having the season that I did, uh, I thought I was going to go and, like, the, I, I knew I wasn't a first rounder, but I knew it, maybe the second through the fourth round is where they were kind of saying that I was going to go. And after those rounds went by, I'm like, okay, now where am I going to go? Like they're, they're telling me, all these scouts are telling me, hey, be ready in the second to fourth. And um, Houston really never even talked to me at all. Like they talked to me one little time. And um, when we went to our regional, um, we played down in Houston and ha had a big, big tournament down there. 
and that's when Houston saw me, and I guess they liked what they saw and took me in the sixth round. So I'm, gl I'm glad I landed in the Astros organization because we're so advanced, and um, it's, it's been really good for me. All right, 20, <laughs> last season, 27 games there, 25 hits, 7 homers, 21 RBI, even stole a base. What kind of year did you have last year in the double-A? Uh, yeah, so um, everybody's saying how making the jump from high A to double A is going to be the hardest jump yeah. you're going to make in professional baseball. And so I was, I was kind of ready for that. Um, I, was, I was trying to mentally prepare before I got up there. And I think the first game, I think I was just a little bit too anxious and I wanted my first hit a little bit too much. So I was swinging pretty hard. Somehow hit it off the end of my bat and a little squibber through the um, first and second baseman. Got my first hit and then I was like, okay, I'm going to settle in a little bit here and um, took off from there. And yeah, I mean, I, I loved Whataburger Field's a hitter's ballpark. It's, I mean, if you get up in the air, it's going to go. So um, knowing that the power that I have, and if, and if I get a good swing on it, I was going to be just fine in double A. I mean, it is a grind to get drafted, to get through the minor leagues and get to the major leagues, isn't it? Of the, there were 12 draft picks in 2017 by the Astros, including yourself. I think one of them has been even in a major league game so far in the three or four years since then. I mean, it, it is a tough thing to make it to the majors, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's very difficult. It's Like you said, it's definitely a grind. Um, those long bus rides, and uh, actually the Texas League that we're in for Corpus, our shortest bus ride that we have is nine hours, and our longest shortest? one is six. Yeah, and our, six, er, our longest is 16 hours. So after, after those uh, bus rides and uh, playing away, and then all of a sudden we have to get back on the bus and drive all the way back home, get home at six in the morning, and then have to play that night, it's, it's a grind. But I mean, it's something I've always dreamed of doing is playing professional baseball. So um, I, I just gotta take every, every little thing and just kind of go with it. And yeah, there's gonna be some um, bumps in the road, but um, just gotta enjoy it while I can. All right, so right now, I mean, we're sitting here in June and you don't think there's gonna be any minor league baseball for sure this summer so what what position does that put you in right now um well until i hear for sure if, if, if we're gonna have a minor league season or not i um, just gonna keep like i said keep working like it's like it's normal season keep working out and everything and uh but if we don't have a season i'm gonna come out here i'm gonna help um brandon's legion team um help out with assistant coach and whatnot and um do get some reps in myself too and just just try to stay in shape as best as i can and just wait until we hear something for sure. And then if maybe the major leagues do get going, there's a possibility they'll be picking up some minor league players. Right, yeah. So that, hopefully I can be one of those 10 to 15 extra guys that they pick up and go and at least get some some sort of baseball in. All right. Good luck, buddy. Appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Coming up next, Kairos means a time when conditions are right for accomplishment and how the Kairos Volleyball Club has taken that translation, turned that mission statement into one of the best youth programs in the country. Welcome back to Bench Warmers. The new Avera Human Performance Center in South Sioux Falls is home to one of the best youth volleyball organizations around. The Kairos Club is still going strong even under the current corona conditions. Here's Elena Lanson with the story. Well, things are looking a little different this summer. You're now able to have some small group lessons. Um, what's the biggest thing you're looking to do with the athletes as they come off of this break? Uh, you know, really, it's just trying to get them introduced to physical activity again. Um, you know, trying to get their bodies ready to be moving around like we were before all this happened. And then just get familiar with volleyball again and trying to get them as many touches as possible. And in July, you're going to have some open gyms and different camps. What all are you offering um, when those doors open in July? Yeah, so as of right now, all of our summer programs are on as scheduled. Um, we have stuff ranging from preschool all the way through seniors in, in high school, um, a, a wide array of different camps that focus on different um, skills, different positions. Um, there's really there's kind of something out there for everybody. And our camps are starting in the, the middle of July and they go through uh, the middle of August. And that will also help prepare the athletes for tryouts come fall. Is there anything that you would say a big specific thing that they could focus on when heading into those tryouts? Yeah, really, um, you know, like you mentioned, our camps are geared towards helping the athlete get ready for their upcoming fall season. Um, you know, we tell all of our players heading in into tryouts, it's, it's really important just to try to get as many touches as possible um, so that when you do show up to your school tryout, you, you feel prepared uh, mentally and physically. So our, our camps, uh, we really try to maximize the whole uh, session. Uh, we're trying to do things every second of the session, very little 
um, you know, time off and trying to get the kids as many touches as possible. And you can still sign up for those camps. Um, where can you go and how many kids uh, would you expect to see at those camps? Yeah, so um, all of our camps, I think the only ones that are full so far are, are some of our sessions in our youth academy. Uh, but most of our camps still are, are open for registration. Um, you can go to our website at averasportsteams.com. Um, you can click on Kairos Volleyball um, and then click on the Summer Camps tab. And another big thing that's becoming more and more popular is boys volleyball. I know you've had a lot of interest in open gyms. Uh, what would you say about the growth in that department for guys? Yeah, so th the last couple of years we've seen some good growth in boys volleyball. Um, it was unfortunate uh, with the, you know, what happened with, with the shutdown and everything. Um, we had things planned this spring for boys volleyball and that got, kind of got put on the back burner. Um, but we're looking to do stuff again. Uh, maybe towards the end of the summer, and then we do a lot um, of boys stuff in the fall. That's That's been the last three years has been our uh, main boys season is during the fall. We've had teams, um, and then they've competed in tournaments. So we'll see you know, what things look like this fall, but at the very minimum, we're, we'll try to get kids in for open gyms. Well, I know we're excited to see those numbers grow. Thank you so much. Yep. Up next, we go to Brookings and chat with Tyler Merriam on the state of athletics. At the moment, it's South Dakota State University. Hopes and plans for the start of football and fall sports at SDSU. Benchwarmers on Midco Sports Network is presented by Avera Orthopedics. Welcome back to Benchwarmers. Hanging out now in Brookings with Tyler Merriam, the Associate Athletic Director for Media, officially. Unofficially, something along those Ra lines. Radio yeah. guy for how long now? Face for radio. This will be the 10th year doing Jackrabbit football play-by-play. -play. I'm getting old, Tom. No, you're not. But little man Joe, how, how old's your son Joe now? Joe is six and a half. Doing well, hanging out with Tyler Glidden. He, back he is. You can see him back here. He's hanging out back here, building some marble runs. And uh, we're a big family here among the Jackrabbits. All right. Um, the football stadium sitting behind us as well. Athletic facilities, for the most part, closed across the state, closed here on campus. What's kind of the status of what's going on as far as athletics in general right now? Well, first off, a man you know very well, Jeff Holm, has been phenomenal. Uh, our uh, senior associate AD for facilities and operations putting together a game plan for how to slowly get everything back open. So it's a phased reopening all across campus. It's just slowly but surely trying to get people back in the safest way possible. So head coaches, uh, some of our senior administrators are able to be on campus for a few hours here or there, but certainly it's not normal life. Uh, no assistant coaches, nobody like me is allowed in our offices. And, and so really it's just baby steps trying to get to a, a point where we can establish some sort of normality. Hopefully in mid-July, this is an NCAA proposal at least that I saw that mid-July you would allow uh, you know, players back on campus, start to do some team activities by then, start some practices maybe in mid-August, and then have four weeks at least before the first football games. Right now we're about 75 days or so away from that home opener, what would be the home opener here for the Jacks against Butler. Still planning on that. As far as we know, we're not changing anything until we have to. It's kind of the way everybody's going about it, right? Exactly. There's so many question marks right now. And so rather than panic about things you have no control over, we are all very optimistic, very hopeful that we will have a, a game plan in place. And, and we do uh, that we'll be able to execute. And so we'll be able to have volleyball as normal, softball uh, when we get to the uh, workouts for them, obviously for soccer home events, for football down the line. We want to have a normal fall from an athletic standpoint. And that's the hope. Now, obviously, as as the days go by, things could change and we'll deal with those as they come. There are a bunch of plans that are uh, been drawn up in case those things come about, but hopefully they don't. All right, talk about football, the program a little bit. One big departure in the coaching staff, Dan Jackson, beloved assistant coach, uh, the Nebraska Jacks handled, brought all those kids up from Nebraska as a recruiter, has gone to Northern Illinois now. Replaced by whom, and is this a big shakeup on the coaching staff for football? Well, obviously bringing Rob Erickson in to, to handle some special teams and be cornerbacks coach. You lose a guy like Dan Jackson, Dan's such a good recruiter, uh, social media maven, did so many different things. Uh, it certainly is a, a loss, but John Stigelmeyer always talks about next man up, and you have guys like Zach Lujan who've taken bigger roles, and so it certainly is a loss but uh, it isn't anything SDSU hasn't dealt with before. You know, lost a couple of coordinators not that long ago, and, and we're able to be a top eight seed again. So it certainly is something that the program is feeling, uh, but by the same token, we've seen it with uh, some star athletes that have left. We talked about those coaches. You just uh, you re-energize, and you find the, the next guy that's ready for it, and you go from there. And the next player up, you talk about that every year. 
one player, we saw guys, Jackson Yankee, guys like that, uh, emerge last year as almost stars for the Jackrabbits as young guys. A couple of guys maybe this year that we're going to see in SDSU football that are really kind of going to blow up. Well, I think Yankee's one that's going to get a lot more opportunities when you look at uh, just the way the offense will be. I think he's certainly one. I think a guy like Logan Backus, who, of course, has been a captain, but now he's going to have a different role because you lose a four-year starter at middle linebacker. So I think he's another guy that you, you really have to, to look to. And, and there's two or three other guys in the middle there that you've you've looked around and you've seen glimpses here or there of, of what they're capable of. But I think certainly if I had to pick one guy on each side of the ball, I think Backus is ready for a big jump as a senior. And I'm excited to see what Yankee can do opposite K. Johnson at wide yeah, Bacchus has been so good for so yes. long, just kind of in the shadow of Christian Rosemont. Talking about uh, some of the greats that have moved on, when we come back, we're going to pick our top four, our Mount Rushmore, the top four athletes from the last 10 years here at South Coast State University, and we'll do that when we come back on Bench Warmers. Welcome back to Bench Warmers, hanging out in beautiful Brookings with Tyler Merriam this week. And all this summer on the show, we are doing our Mount Rushmore, our top four athletes of the last 10 years at each of the schools that we cover on Midco Sports Network. And we limited it to 10 years. We thought that would be easier, but it's been a good 10 years here at South Dakota State. This was not easy for you and I to, to work, uh, whittle this down to just four. Yeah, I felt pretty good about the top 10, but having to go inside of 10 was challenging. I think we got a real good consensus at the top five, and then that four five mark was, you know, it's kind of like that one two seed divide on the bubble there at the NCAA tournament. This was challenging. There was some consideration for a volleyball player, yep. a, a, a soccer player, Maggie Smither, a softball player. We're all considered, and we Jake Winicky's not even on the list. That tells you how. That was a tough. That was a tough final decision. There was three or four football players that we strongly considered, and Winicky was probably the last cut. Wouldn't right. you agree? The one foot, yeah, the one football guy we did pick was Zach Zenner, and this was. I mean, you look back in 10 years, and he's not the all-time leader. Josh Gronick still has that record, but three straight 2,000-yard seasons for Zach Zenner puts him on the list. Why? Three-time All-American, uh, a guy who really changed the program because when you look at it, he was the one that was really the, the guiding light, the star that led SDSU from a good program to really being a great program. He was the one that, that set it up. And, and you look now, and no knock on everybody, but uh, the offensive line is better now than it was then. You know, Zenner was more of a one-man wrecking crew at that point. And three straight years of 2,000 yards when everybody was keying on him, just phenomenal. And you had love for one of the old linemen, Jacob Onisorgi, here the last couple of years. You thought he should have been considered. When you're named the Remington Award winner, when you get voted the best center in all of college football, that's uh, that's pretty high praise, and he deserved to be talked about. So I'm glad you brought him up. Yeah, Taryn Christian. Christian Rosenbaum also uh, honorable mention there. One women's basketball player, and it's the all-time scoring leader, Macy Miller, uh, 2,355 points, led the Jacks to a sweet 16. What about Macy? Never lost a Summit League tournament game. That, to me, is, says it all about Macy Miller. She was a winner, and uh, a, a young lady who, uh, when she needed to take over a game, could, but was also more than happy to distribute the basketball. I mean, obviously played with Maddie Giebert, the best three-point shooter in school history, but Macy did it in a variety of ways, and just remembering back the last few weeks of her senior year, she just got more more, and more comfortable in her own skin. It was so much fun to watch her develop, and, and uh, she'll be a part of the, the Jackrabbits here in the future as well, so really excited to have Macy back and uh, uh, she's very deserving of this. In what capacity? What are you talking uh, about? She'll work with the coaching staff. She wants to be a coach and uh, tried her hand playing overseas, and now we'll come back and be a part of Aaron Johnson's staff, and we're all excited about that. Yeah, she, she's unquestionably the GOAT. I mean, there's no, uh, no debate there there with Macy Miller. Basketball now for the men. We had to include a couple of guys, of course. Nate Walters was the guy that, as you said, kind of like Zach Center. When South Coast State got really got it going at the Division One level, it was Walters that kind of led the way. All-American on multiple occasions, and again, put SDSU on the map. Uh, it was something that we often talked about, is that men's basketball and making that NCAA tournament, there's just something else to it. And when you talk about putting South Dakota State on the map nationally, that was what was going to do it, and Walters did it, beating a nationally ranked uh, New Mexico team, the win at Washington his junior year. So many memories of Nate Walters. Uh, obviously, a great pro career that continues. Uh, he's as special as they come. Career assist leader also had the school, still has the school record, 53 point game uh, back in 2013. And we thought that his, what, 2300 and some points would never be surpassed. And then Mike Dom comes along and has an incredible, he had a good redshirt freshman season. And then as a sophomore, junior, and senior, Dom was incredible. 
seventh all-time in scoring. Mike Dom is on the list as well. We talked about it when Nate Walters graduated. We better enjoy this. We'll never see anybody right, like right, this. Right. And then a few years later, you have Mike Dom, who, again, obliterates every scoring record in Summit League in South Dakota State history. And just a guy who, who could take over a game. And where Nate was a little flashier at times, Mike wasn't as flashy. But my goodness, you just watched that ball leave his hand. And, and, uh, and I remember one of the assistant coaches, Ben Walker, telling me a couple of years ago, the thing that amazed him most about Mike Dom was he'd be in there with the trees, two and three guys banging on him, and yet it was so soft that touch he had around the rim despite all that physicality that's incredibly tough for a big man to have and his range I mean there's a reason why he's one of the greatest scorers in NCAA basketball history 10 threes in one game he's still the he is the career leader in three-point field goals made free throws made rebounds scoring as well so uh, Mike Nam and Nate Walters join Macy Miller and Zach Zenner on the Mount Rushmore for South Dakota State what's happening in the next uh, you know a month or so here for you as uh, we try to get back to normal at South Dakota State. Well, like we talked about, we're making a lot of plans and trying to operate as much in the business as normal realm as we can while we're not in the office. So a lot of Zoom meetings. I didn't know how valuable Zoom would be until we, Fun, huh? we started this a few months ago. Well, some people don't have to see me or smell me on a regular basis. They probably enjoy that. But uh, we're, we're trying to plan uh, for everything to happen as normal come the fall and then the winter beyond that and all the scheduling and whatnot. So schedules are getting finished. They're in place. And, and we hope that uh, we can get through all of this together and that we can reunite uh, in this football stadium here in a couple of months and, and get back to business as normal. I never thought I'd be this happy to see you as I am today, Tom. Great to see you, man. Thanks a lot. Tyler Marion. We'll be right back. Take a look at next week on Bench Warmers. Bench Warmers on Midco Sports Network is presented by Avera Orthopedics. Coming up next week, uh, we have some tips for us old guys, the weekend warriors from our friends at Avera Health. And our North Coast State guy, Brian Sean, will join us for all things Bison and his top four NDSU athletes of the last decade. See you next week on Bench Warmers.